BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to the book of Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, Numbers Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 20. This is message E308. We're doing Parash number 39, Parash number 39, Chukat. It's from Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 19 through chapter 22, verse 1. Numbers chapter 19. Uh, verse 1 through 22, verse 1. We're going to start off as we've been doing through this whole series of um, what is the main portion of, uh, main verse of the, the, the parash. Let's go to Bamidbar 20. Bamidbar 20. And let's look at verse 7 and 8. Bamidbar 20, verse 7 and 8. Jehovah said to Moshe, Take this staff, assemble the community, you and Aram, your brother, and before their eyes, tell the rock to produce its water. You will bring them water out of the rock and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Amen? So here what we're looking at is something very important. Listening to every word the Lord says very carefully. Because when you don't listen to the, every word the Lord says very carefully, some things could be very messed up, okay? So the Lord specifically says to Moshe, take the staff, we're going to go through this later, we're going to go in detail, take your staff and tell the rock to produce, okay? It is the word, uh, tell is the word debar in Hebrew, debar. Um, it is H1696, it means to speak, declare, converse, have a conversation with the rock. Okay, command, promise, warn, threaten, sing. Okay, so have a conversation with the rock, tell it to produce its water. That's what he was supposed to do, but we're going to go over what happened and what the ramifications of the actions are. Okay, it's also part of tomorrow's message of uh, 652. Okay, let's go on to the next slide there, tech department. Let's go back to uh, channel 19. No, not channel 19, numbers 19. Channel 19, <laughs> Numbers 19, verse 1 through 5. 1 through 5, there you see a big red cow. That would be a really good steak. Mm. 19, verse 1 through 5, Jehovah said to Moshe and Aaron, this is the regulation from the Torah, which Jehovah has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a young red female cow without fault or defect, which has never borne a yoke, you are to give it to Eleazar, Eleazar, the Cohen. It is to be brought outside the camp and slaughtered in front of him. Eleazar, the Cohen, is to take some of his blood with his finger and sprinkle this blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. The heifer is to be burned to ashes before his eyes. Its skin, meat, blood, and dung is to be burned to ashes. Amen? So here, what we're starting off is more of um, the anointing of the people and the anointing of the Kohanim. So here, the, a re, specifically a red cow, which is, they're not very abundant. And now you're burning up a female red cow, which is very interesting, okay? So, you know, in Leviticus, we went into more of the detail of this. But specifically, the red cow 
scientifically, we have some chemists and biologists in our congregation, and I asked, you know, what, why, what's the difference between a red and a black cow or a white, a oh, black and white cow? You know, you see the spotted cows, you know, everybody sees the moo cows, okay? But what, what is the difference between the red? There is a chemical difference that God does in the red cows, and it's going to be actually very healthy. The ashes that we put into the water for the cleansing is going to have some other chemical principles that the Lord, you know, wasn't, you know, there wasn't chemists back in the time, and they didn't have microscopes to look through. But there, once you do a chemical analysis of the red heifer, and you put it in the water, and you either drink some of that water or you wash in that water, it is very good for your body for health. Okay, so here it is specifically a female red cow. Okay, it's being brought outside the camp. The, th the anointing for the people, and the anointing for this cow, uh, not for the cow, for the people, and the blood to sprinkle on the people. The bl blood, specifically here, what we're looking at for these particular verses, is the sprinkling of the blood outside of the camp. There you see in the picture, I know you can't see it in here, and we've got to still do it, uh, you know, put it up on so you guys can see it. Um, we'll still start doing that next week. Uh, we've got more and more people coming on Friday night at 11 o'clock. Woo! Okay, so... Um, it's, there's a gate there, okay? So outside the gate, outside the, 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 the area where the people are going to be living, you're going to bring that offering where you're going to sprinkle the blood on the people outside of the gated area, outside the, the area where the people are living, okay? Specifically, this is for an offering, a sin offering, and this is a sin offering, okay? The red cow, as we learned in Viacra and Leviticus, the sin offering was brought outside the camp. Now hold your place in... Uh, Numbers 19, hold your place there, and turn to Matthew 15. Uh, sorry, Mark, Mark 15. Mark 15, verse 22 to 31. Mark 15, verse 22 to 31. It's a pretty long reading, but we're going to read it anyway. Okay, remember the red cow is brought outside the camp. Uh, the blood is going to be spilt out there. That is for a sin offering. Okay, Mark 15, verse 22 to 31. 22 to 31, they brought Yeshua to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they gave him wine spiced with myrrh, but he didn't take it. They nailed him to the execution sake of the cross, and they divided his clothes among them, throwing dice to determine what each man would get. It was nine in the morning when they nailed him to the cross. Over his head was written a notice to charge against him the king of the Jews. On the execution, uh, the cross with him were placed two robbers, one on the right, one on the left. Verse 29. Uh, people passing by hurled incense, not incense, insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! So you can destroy the temple, can you, and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the head Kohanim and the Torah teachers made fun of him, saying to each other, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Amen? So we read this passage because we know the Yeshua is this, the sin offering for the world. When he came over the hill, what did his cousin Yochanan say about his, his cousin Yeshua? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So where was Yeshua? We see specifically in verse 22. Let's read that again. They brought Yeshua to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Okay, where was he brought to? He was out side the camp, okay? Now we looked at the, the cow, and the, the, that it's a sin offering. Now why? We brought the cow outside the camp. We sprinkled the blood. Now when Yeshua was nailed to the cross, what was happening while he was on the cross? Okay, every, you know, every time his heart pumped, you know, the spurt, 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 dripping from his blood. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He was dripping blood outside. It was sprinkling on anything that it hit. When it came down, splash, splash. Especially once he started to lose a fair amount of blood, there was a puddle, okay? So, and then the other guys were, were sweating and probably, you know, throwing up and things like that. So there's all this disgustingness on the ground, okay? But specifically what we're looking at here is he was brought outside the camp. That's why we know he goes to Golgotha, because you're not going to crucify people inside the 
the temple walls inside the Jerusalem property. You know, when you go to Israel, you see the walls of Jerusalem. When you come up Jerusalem Road, when you come down in the valley and then you go up and you see that big wall, that's the outside of the city. Okay, it's the city limits. So Yeshua would have been brought outside that city because you don't want dead things inside the city. It's unclean, it's unsanitary, and everything like that. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Let's go back to Leviticus, uh, not Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers 19. Numbers 19, verse 6 through 8. Numbers 19, verse 6 through 8. Numbers 19, verse 6 through 8. The Kohen is to take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet yarn, and throw them onto the heifer as it is burning up. Then the Kohen is to wash his clothes and make himself and wash his clothes and himself in water after which he may re-enter the camp but the cone will remain unclean until evening the person who burned up the heifer is to wash his clothes and himself in water but he will remain unclean until evening amen so here we see a step process we first see in verse 6 that they're putting other things on the heifer as I told you in the, in the previous slide, or the two slides ago, that the heifer, the red cow, has a lot of different principles in its body than the regular cow does. Okay, the red, there's something that the Lord puts in it, but now the cedar wood, hyssop, and the scarlet yarn, why put them on? Well, these are also things that are, that when you breathe them in, okay, when you breathe them in, you're, you're going to be breathing in medicine. So here, the Kohen is going to be bringing them out. They're going to be burning up. Everybody's going to be standing in around it, and it's going to be a barbecue, and it's going to smell good. Okay? What happens when you start a barbecue? Men come, you know, never see that. You, you, it's like, where did all you guys come from? Well, we smelt the barbecue. Okay? Well, it's been going on for a couple of thousand years. Okay? So here, you're putting it on. People are around. The smell, you know, the cows, you know, it's not like a little barbecue that we're used to. Well, maybe if you're from other parts of the country like Texas, the part that's not underwater, you know, maybe you go to big barbecues, okay? So here, you're burning up a whole cow, but you're also putting the cedar wood. Cedar wood is very good for your respiratory. Hyssop is very good for any type of sickness, 99 different things that were possibly wrong with you. So the Lord is taking that sin offering outside the camp, and then the smoke is building around. It's going up to heaven. But medicine is going into the people. So it's going to be healthy because you're going to be breathing in it because you're breathing into your lungs, and then it goes into your respiratory system. Your respiratory system is connected to your circulatory system. And then all this medicine is going inside of all the people. The scarlet is also. It's part of the frankincense and myrrh, the scarlet yarn. It's had some of the similar principles of frankincense and myrrh. Okay, so you're going to be breathing in all this healthy, then it's also a red heifer, a red cow. So the Lord is making the people heifer, making the people healthy with the heifer. Making the people healthy with the heifer. I said heifer healthy. Okay, set it backwards, strike that, reverse it. Okay, then we see verse 7, then the Cohen is to wash his clothes and himself in water, after which he may re-enter the camp, but the cone will remain unclean until evening. Amen? So he's going to wash because you, you're, you've got this blood on you. You need to wash because in the blood, this is why we spill out the blood. We don't eat blood because in the blood is viruses. Okay? You wash the blood off in case anything got on you. Most viruses don't last that long, except for hepatitis that lasts up to 72 hours on the ground. HIV will last a couple of minutes on the ground, okay? So you're washing the blood off, but he's remaining unclean. That means nobody is to touch him until evening, okay? That's a process of the Lord. This is all health-related, okay? You're not touching him, okay? Because he may, have, he may be a carrier. There are some people that, you know, let's say that you work in a public school. God forbid you work in a public school, but let's say you do, okay? Or when I used to work in the hospital. I used to change or at least um, switch clothes. It would be better to change and wash before you, you hug your, your spouse or you, your children come and touch you. You know, a lot of times, you know, there's locker rooms in the hospital where you switch clothing because you can be a carrier 
of the virus, any virus that you might have been in contact with. So here he's unclean until evening. Okay, then in verse 8, it's important also, the person who burned up the heifer is to wash his clothes and himself in water, but he will remain unclean until evening, amen? So you see there's a second person. It's an important part of scripture, because when we go to the Brit Hanashah, we need to understand why somebody, Shimon, helped carry the cross. There's a second person that helps and assists the anointing, of this with a sin offering. Now hold your place there in Numbers 19. Let's turn to Matthew 3. We're now looking at washing. Numbers 3, uh, not Numbers 3, Matthew 3. Why do I keep doing that? There? Where's my mouse? Okay, Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. We're going to be looking at washing of the clothes. We're going to look at washing. And what's the purpose, okay? The washing is washing off the sin, okay, washing off the offering. Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. Then Yeshua came from the Galal to the Yarden to be immersed by Yochanan, but Yochanan tried to stop him. You're coming to me? I ought to be immersed by you. However, Yeshua answered him, Let it be this way now, because we should do everything righteousness requires. Then Yochanan let him. As soon as Yeshua had been immersed, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son. This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. Wow. Okay. Now, what we're looking at is Yeshua went outside the city. Remember? Not immersing in the city. He's going outside the city, just like he took the heifer outside the city. And then he t there's another person to assist him with the immersion. Now, here in verse 15, once again, let's read it. He answered him, let it be this way now, because we should do everything righteousness required, then Yochanan let him. Amen? Now, here, it's another important part that Yochanan is a Kohen. Okay? He's a Kohen. He's, he's, a, as a, he's even higher than that. He's a Nazar Nazarene. Uh, Nazarite, Nazarite, okay? He was set aside, and now he's out there eating bugs and honey, okay? Kosher bugs, okay? And he, Yeshua comes in. You have to do this outside the city. You have to wash the clothes. You know, Yeshua didn't go and put his Speedos on and the thing about his head, you know, crop his beard. He, he went, went in with his clothes, okay? They didn't have bathing suits back then. So he went in. Washed his clothes from the sin, and then goes back. Then after that, starts his ministry. Okay, all righteousness required. Going on to the next slide. Going on to the next slide. Go back to the midbar, Numbers 19, verse 11 through 13. Numbers 19. Verse 11 through 13. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, will be unclean for seven days. He must purify himself with these ashes on the third, pardon, third and seventh days when he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself the third and seventh day, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, and does not purify himself, has defiled the tabernacle of Jehovah. That person will be cut off from Israel because the water for purification was not sprinkled on him. He will be unclean. His uncleanliness is still on him. Amen? So in this water for purification is the ashes for the red heifer. Okay? It's going to be, it's a medicine that the Lord was doing. Okay? So here, if you touch a dead body, you don't know why the body died, okay? So you touch a dead body no matter whose dead body it is. Okay, so this is tough for some people in certain industries, okay? And you're unclean for seven days. Then, now this is for the temple, okay? He says, um, but it's also for us to understand, and this is why in the Hebrew, you, you go to something when somebody dies, sitting shiva, okay? 
or sh so it comes from the word sheva, which seven days of unpure, unpure. Uh, you're not pure, impure. Okay, so look at verse twelve again. He is he must purify himself on the third and seven days. Then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself the third and seven days, he will not be clean. Amen. So here, this is. You have to have the ashes of the red heifer, but we don't, okay? So some things we cannot do, but they do have the ashes of the red heifer in Israel, okay? They are ready, and they are, this is for the Kohanim, for the purification, for working inside the temple, because they can't be sick before the Lord. So the third and seventh days, okay? You want to make sure somebody is staying separate for those days. You know, a lot of times you get sick, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor writes a prescription, Okay, and what does it say? You take this medicine for seven days. What do most people do? They take it for three. Okay, okay, so the Lord is saying, I want you to follow through with what I'm doing. Okay, because a lot of people feel better after the third day, and then all of a sudden on the fifth day they get sick again. It's because you didn't follow through with the order from the doctor. Okay, now here, uh, let's look at verse 13 again. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, and does not purify himself, has defiled the tabernacle of Jehovah. That person will be cut off from Israel because the water for purification was not sprinkled on him. He will be unclean. His uncleanliness is still on him. Amen? So you see this is specific for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. Okay? There are some things that are referenced in the law that are specific for the tabernacle. Okay? Now we don't have this. So you cannot do this. There's only one red cow that has burned up, been burned up properly, and it's in Israel. Okay, they've got it for the Kohanim, for the, the Sanhedrin that is back in business, and they're being a little bit of a pain. They hate the Messianics that it was sold today. Okay, a lot of very bad things going on in Israel against the Messianics. They like the homos better than they like the Messianics. They like the seculars who don't do anything than the Messianics. Don't worry, we're gonna win. All right. Anyway, let's move on to the next slide. Let's go to chapter 20, verse 1, please. The people of Israel, the whole community, entered the Zin Desert in the first month. They stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died, and there she was buried. Amen? So now... I want you to put this into perspective because we're going to go into something that mo happens to Moshe. But I want you to see that there are ramifications for your actions, but also when you're stressed, is a lot of times when people get stressed, their ears shut. Okay? The higher the stress goes because you're not trusting in the Lord, you're not having shalom that passes all understanding, a lot of times you, you think you're doing well, but you're not. Okay, we're going to see something that happened to a great friend of the Lord called Moshe. And we know that he's in heaven because in the Brit Hanashah, his feet do touch the promised land. He ministers to Yeshua. Okay, Yeshua led him through the desert for 40 years because it was the angel that had the name of the Lord inside of him. We've gone over that. But I want you to, we're going to put this into perspective. Okay, sometimes with the, the Erev Shabbat messages, I'm going to add a little bit more to these teachings because we're just doing English and we're seeing a very big uh, uptick on our English side. Okay, we're now, we went up another 10 people on our English side. No, 9 people on the English side on our YouTube channel and 10 on our Spanish side. Okay, so here, look at verse 1 again. I want to go over this. The people of Israel, the whole community, entered the Zin Desert in the first month, then they stayed at Kadesh, there Miriam died, and there she was buried. Amen? So, remember, Moshe had, uh, their parents had three children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No. Um, they had Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, some, and they're not that d different in age. You know, sometimes when you get a lot, you, know, you have like six or seven kids, which every family should be having, Okay. Because, see, when you have a lot of kids, then you, you'll have good power when you're troubled at the gate, okay? But what's happening in, in the Christendom and Messianic, they're having one or two children, which is not good, okay? Now, Miriam and um, Aaron and Moses were the only three children. Now, they were a little, under a little stress, okay, because Pharaoh was trying to kill them all, 
Okay, so let's bring that back now. Now, we, I do that because we're looking at this. There was only the, Moshe had a brother and a sister. Now his sister dies. Whether, uh, and she came against him a time or two, but, you know, Moses was like this nice guy. I'm not a nice guy like Moses, and everybody will tell you that, okay? So, you know, it's one of my, oh, he's a terrible person. Well, whatever. Anyway, Moses probably loved his sister. Now, I can take or leave my sister, but I don't want to see her go to hell. She doesn't know the Messiah. But let's put it into perspective for most people. If a sibling dies, even though they're kind of old, Moses is at least 80, and his sister is older than him, just like my sister. <laughs> okay? He probably had some feelings for a sister of love because it was a sister. Okay? They were in the same community. Okay? So... This happens, and I want you to put that in your mind as we go further along in what goes, goes on here. Now, this is the first month, okay, so we know it's in the month of Pesach, and, you know, that's going to be a, a stressful time for the, the whole people because, you know, Pe Pesach and Hagmatza and Bikarim, you know. So here, adding stress, your sister dies. But doesn't matter. When God tells you to do something, we have to listen closely. We have to listen closely. Going on to the next slide. Let's go to verse 2 now. 2 through 6. 2 through 6. Now let's see what happens next. Moshe's Moshe sisters dies. Now, because the community had no water, they assembled themselves against Moshe and Aaron. Why did you bring uh, Jehovah's community into the desert to die there? We and our livestock. Why did you make us leave Egypt to bring us to this terrible place without seeds, figs, grapevines, pomegranates, and even water to drink? Moshe and Aaron left the assembly, went to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of Jehovah appeared to him. Amen? Uh, now, let's take a look at this. His sister dies. A little stressful. Okay? Now, right after that, in the next verse, now the community comes against Moshe. And Aaron. Okay, they assemble themselves. Now they're, they're blaming Moshe for taking them out of Egypt. Did I hold a gun to your head? I said, follow me. And you did, because you wanted to leave being a slave. Now, now remember, because we're looking at stress, and there's ramifications for your actions. There's ramifications for your actions, okay? So there could be good things for your, you do good, you get good ramifications, you do bad, you sin, there can be bad ramifications, okay? So we're looking at this, remember Miriam just died, okay? They're in the desert, they don't have a Bible to read. This is all happening like right there, okay? We're so blessed, and this is what, what I, I get so aggravated with people, is we're so blessed, we know the whole story. We know the end. We, we, we know this we know the Brit Hadashah, we got Yeshua, we even got a lot of Paul's old stories and his things, and then we got the book of Revelation, but yet we still don't follow the Lord. Okay? But here, Moshe doesn't have, hey, let me turn to chapter 21 to see what happens. You know, wouldn't that be good? Okay, but he doesn't. Okay, so here, they're in the desert. Now look at verse 4. Let's see what the, they, they, they bother him with. Why did you bring Jehovah's community into the desert to die there? We and our, our livestock. Amen. Wait, wait, whose livestock was it? Who, was it yours in Egypt? No. No, it was not. You were slaves. You owned nothing. So now you're forgetting where you came from, but this is going to be a lot of stress on Moshe. A lot of stress on Moshe and I. Remember, they're in their 80s. Hi, what are you talking about? I said, I held up a stick and you followed me. Okay, so now let's look at verse 5. Why did you make us leave Egypt? To bring us to this terrible place without seed, figs, grapevines, pomegranates, or even water to drink. Amen? So now they're complaining about the food. Okay? Jews complain about food all the time still to this day. Okay? All right? So now they're saying, now we got no food. Uh, you, you brought us out to the desert. The stress level is probably going up with Moshe and Aaron. But it doesn't mean you can make a mistake, especially in leadership. The more responsibility you have, you must keep your emotions in check, okay? No matter what happens, 
You keep your eyes on the Lord. You listen for the Lord to speak. You listen to the Ruach HaKodesh, and everything will be fine. Now here, in verse 5 again, they go, we got no water. We got no water. Now remember, there were 600,000, over 600,000 men that were counted for the military. That's not counting women and children and the goyim. Okay? So let's just say there's probably about 6 million people. Okay? Because remember, in Egypt, what were they doing? They were procreating a lot. Okay? That's why Pharaoh wanted to put them in slavery. Because so you figure each family, you know, let's say 400,000 of them are married. Okay? So 400,000 men are married. Each of them's got five, six kids. Okay? Five, six kids, 400,000. That's a lot of people to get water. Where are we going to get water for 500,000 people? Where are we going to get water for 5 million people? Where are we going to get water? This is a little stressful. Okay? Can we go to Walmart? What's Walmart? Okay? Can we go to Kmart? What's Kmart? Can we go to H-Mart? Oh, H-Mart. We want to go to H-Mart. No. Can we... They're, you know, they're, they can't stop anywhere. Imagine this. Moses is like, you know, his sister just died. Now the people, the whole... Now, in verse 2 it said, the community, the community comes against them. So now Moshe and Aaron, look at verse 6. Moshe and Aaron left the assembly, went to the entrance of the tent of a meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of Jehovah appeared to them. Amen? So these two old guys go to the tent of a meeting, and they fall on their faces. Okay? Because they don't know what to do. By when they fall on their faces, that means the stress level is high. It's red alert. They don't know what to do. They're just going to fall on their faces before the Lord. And the, you're, you're leaving yourself open. You know, when you fall on your face, you can't defend yourself when you're on your face. You're on your back. You can block. You can do a lot of different things. But you're on your face. You can't see. Okay? So now, by, by when they're falling on their faces, that means they don't know what to do. They're going to give it to God, which we all should do. When you don't know what to do, fall on your face before the Lord and pray. And pray. Okay, then, then you learned, you learned. I said, did you pray? No. But then when you prayed, the Lord answers. Okay, but you know that stress, I'm sure we prayed before you're interviewed today. Okay, and then good things happen. When you put it in the Lord's court, good things happen, but you have to listen. Now, both of you, were you stressed? Yes. So then your ears, what happens sometimes when you're stressed, you start talking like, sure, 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 sure. You know, like Charlie Brown. Yes, ma'am. That's all you hear. You don't really hear because then what happens when you're stressed, you make big mistakes. Sometimes mistakes that can't be taken back. Okay? So Moshe, he's, let's just say his sister died. The community came against him. There's no food. There's no bodega. There's no supermarket. Well, you know, he's a little tr stressed out. Him and Aaron go to the tent and they boom. And then the Lord says, my sons, what can I do for you? Okay? So let's go down to the next slide. Let's see what happens. Whoop. Let's go. Let's go to, Re hold your place there. Turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 6. Hold your place in Bamidbar. Revelation 21. Now, if you miss any part of this teaching or you missed other teachings, you can go to our website, bgmctv.com or bethgoim.org. Okay? So you missed it. And while you're on our website, you know what? Hit the doggone donate button. Now we're in Revelation 21, verse 6. Back from our commercial message. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and end. To anyone who is thirsty, I myself will give water free of charge from the fountain of life. Amen? So here, let's say there's a lot of stress going on in Revelation at the end of the book there. Okay? And Yeshua says, anyone who's thirsty, come to me. Just talk to me. Talk to me. When you're thirsty, talk to the Lord. When you're dry, talk to the Lord. Don't get stressed out. Bring it to God. Bring it to Yeshua the Messiah. And they'll answer your prayers. Bring it to Elohim. And everything will work, work out right. He will bring you the living worth, water 
free of charge. Yeshua's unlike most Jews. He's not going to charge you money, okay, or double the money because you're a goy or something like that, okay? He gives free of charge, but you have to go to him. You have to speak to him. He's there, he's, he's waiting by the phone for your call. All you got to do is dial 777-777. Just keep hitting 7 until he picks up. Okay? He's waiting for your call. But when a lot of people get stressed out, they, they seek friends, they seek other people, but they don't seek God because their ears are... Go on to the next slide. Go back to Bamin Bar 20, verse 7 and 8. Numbers 20, verse 7 and 8. Numbers 20, verse 7 and 8. Jehovah said to Moshe, take the staff, assemble the community, you and Aaron, your brother, just in case you didn't know that, and before their eyes, tell the rock to produce its water. You will bring them water out of the rock and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Amen? So here they, Moshe has stressed, his sister just died. The community is against him. And they, they're crying out for food, water, all this stuff. And they fall on their faces before the Lord. And the Lord says, oh, hey, boys, how you doing? All right, here's what I want you to do. Take your brother, Aaron. You know him. Okay? I love how it says it. You and your Aaron, your brother. Okay? Just in case there was another Aaron, you know, just take Aaron, your brother. Okay? No, I love that because, you know, the, the Lord is thinking of all things because, you know, there's probably another Aaron in the community. All right? You know, okay, I want you to take Aaron, your brother. Okay? Because he knows, the, Jehovah knows all things. He's trying to guide his children. Okay? So he says to the, take the staff. Take the staff. He's giving them a step-by-step -step instructions of what he wants them to do. Take the staff, the one that you led the people out, you know, that one. Okay, not the other one. The one, you know, take the step. You only got one. Oh, right. You only got one. So take that step. Not your, your, your underlings. Not, not that staff. Okay? Like the president has a staff, but he doesn't have a staff. Okay? So take the staff. Assemble the community. Okay? And you and Aaron, your brother, your brother. And before their eyes, tell the rock. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And then the, wa the rock is going to give you its living water, okay? But sometimes when you're stressed, it starts to sound like, <laughs> you know, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. And you didn't hear a word God said because you're stressed, and now there's going to be ramifications of bad for your actions, okay? So let's read verse 7 and 8 again. It's very important to this parash. It's very important to all of us to, the, to this day. Jehovah said to Moshe, take the staff, assemble the community, you and Aaron, your brother, and before, your, before their eyes, tell the rock to produce its water. You will bring them water out of the rock and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Amen? You know, the Lord's not even telling the old guy that whack the rock this time. You know, he's saying, speak to the rock. Hey, but you give me some water. And then what would happen? But when you're stressed, okay, it says, Debar, speak, declare, converse. All you want to do is have a conversation with the rock. But when you're stressed, you start to do silly things. When you're stressed, you don't think things through. You, you try to, you scheme, you do all these different things. But instead of what God tells us to do. So God says, take the staff, the one that you've been using for all this time, assemble the community, the one that's been bothering you, take your brother, Aaron, okay, and before everybody's eyes, just speak. You don't even have to stress yourself out, just rock, bring forth water. Oh, not even, not very hard. Declare to the rock, well, the debar does to mean threaten. Hey, rock, bring water now. Okay, it pops like a zit. Bing. Okay, 
So the Lord is giving you a step-by-step instruction, but a lot of times, like I said, I want you to notice previous verses in 2, 2 through 5, I think we did, he's stressed. He's new at the job. He doesn't have a Bible. The Torah is written in his heart, but nobody's ever done this before. So this is a lesson for us. We have his example, a great example. We got the Lord speaking. We got the book of, we got Yeshua's example. Follow his example. And then we got the book of Revelation all the way to the end. But we, when we get stressed, remember this and whatever goes on in the world, don't let the stress get to you. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you're already following him, he's going to listen. Hold your place there. Numbers 20. Turn to Luke 20. Luke 20, verse 17. 20, verse 17. Luke 20. 20, verse 17. But Yeshua looked searchingly at them, and said, This is what... Verse 20. But Yeshua looked searchingly at them, <clears throat> and said, this is what, then what is this which is written in the Tanakh? The very rock which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Amen? So Yeshua is calling himself the rock. So when you're stressed, the rock will bring forth its living water, his word, his example, his ways. But you've got to listen to what he says to you. And when you don't, There will be ramifications for your actions of good when you listen and ramifications of bad when you don't. This is the greatest thing about studying Torah. It gives you step-by-step instructions how to win the race. But when you stress, oh, they're going to fire me. They're going to do this. Oh, I'm not going to get the job. I'm not going to get this. And then you start doing stupid stuff. Moshe, we're going to see Moshe does something stupid. And it costs him everything. But yet he still had to walk and do his job for the next bunch of years. Let's learn. This is why we study the Torah portion each and every week. Every year. The same thing. You know, next, year, next cycle we're going to spread it out a little longer. We're going to do a three-year cycle. Maybe I might throw some messages in and there. Maybe we'll take a part of it and really build an hour-long message with that. They're there for... History. That's why they're trying to take down all the the statues. They're trying to recreate history. When you remove the stones, when you remove the statues, you remove the history, then you make it your own. God wants us to constantly read Torah. But a lot of people get bored, and that's stupid. You shouldn't be bored with it. Because each stage, you're at a different stage in your life. Whether you're a young person, a teenager, an older person, just married, new parent. Each There's something to learn. There's some golden nugget in each page of the scriptures. And it's to learn so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Let's go back to Bamidbar 20, verse 9 through 11 now. 9 through 11. Bamidbar 20, verse 9 through 11. Moshe took the staff from the presence of Jehovah, as he had ordered him. But after Moshe and Aaron had assembled the community in front of the rock, he said to them, Listen here, you rebels! Are we supposed to bring you water from the rock? Then Moshe raised his hand and hit the rock twice with the staff. With his staff. Water flowed out in abundance, and the community and the livestock drank. Amen? So you can see by verse 10... Moshe is not having a good day. He said, listen here, you rebels. Okay? You can see he's stressed out. His sister dies. The community came against him. He's tired of all these people. He follows the first order. He took the staff. That was the first thing, right? Okay? Then he followed the number step number two. He was with Aaron. In verse 10, he's with Aaron, right? But, see, when you get stressed out, you generally don't follow all the directions. You know, you ever see a man trying to put together a thing that he bought from a key or something like that? Well, let's take a look at the picture. And the worse things go, 
Will, he, will a man pick up the manual? Manuals? We don't need no stinking manuals. And then the thing comes out all broken, and the wife's like, Honey, honey, can I say something to you? Honey, honey. No, leave me alone. Honey, it's on page nine. Look. Read the directions. But Moshe, look, he did number one in the, verse nine. He followed step one. Okay? Verse 10. We see him with Moshe and Aaron. Followed step two. But you can see he's aggravated. He's angry. He's, listen, you rebels. This is not going to go well. Now, there are ramifications for your actions. Ramifications of good. Everything's going okay. God, you went to God, you went to Jehovah, and he said, here's how you do it. This is what I want you to do. Okay, relax. Take a deep breath. Count to ten. Allah, bait, gimbal, you know, count to ten. But no, he listened, but he didn't listen to God. And this is a great lesson to learn, especially if you're starting a new job or in a new, new position or in an old position. Or even the congregation, a new part of life, everyday living. Don't, in this art of war, don't let your emotions guide your actions. Let your mind guide it. But here, look at verse 10. But after Moshe and Aaron had assembled the community in front of the rock, and he said to them, listen here, you rebels, are we supposed to bring you water from the rock? Amen? So listen, then he, did, he, he assembled the community. He took the step. He's with Aaron. He's by the rock. But now, something angered him. Something triggered him. And instead of turning your face upward, you allowed the enemy to come in, Moshe. Now, actions can be good. Actions can be bad. But there's always going to be an equal an opposite reaction to everything you do. Okay? Then we're verse 11. Then Moshe raised his hand and hit the rock twice with his staff. Water flowed out in abundance in the community and their livestock drank. Amen? So Moses failed the test. But God still blessed the rock with the water. He still gave the community water. But it's, we're going to read in a moment that it cost Moshe everything. Okay? Now, why twice? Go on to the next slide. I think it's on the next slide, Tristan. It's pretty small. Okay? The number two in Hebrew is the letter Bet. It's the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the symbol of all, all habitations. Okay? So Moshe hits the rock not once, but twice. Okay? Okay, so number two, the Bet, is the symbol of anything that contains... So in the rock, he's going to hit the rock twice. It contained the water. Okay? The, new, the number two also signifies union, division, and verification. Union, division, verification. Union of husband and wife. They become one flesh after being married and only being married. Division, you need somebody to fight with. Okay? need at least one person to fight with. Okay? Verification. You need two witnesses to stone somebody to death. Union. It, the union of Yeshua with those that walk in spirit and in truth. The unity between the Old Testament and the renewed covenant or the Brit HaDashah. We have two witnesses that condemn and we got the two witnesses in the book of Revelation that testify of God's greatness. Okay? We have in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3, how can two walk together except if they agree? How can two walk together except that they agree? Okay? Let's, uh, let's uh, move on from there. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to now Numbers 20, verse 12. 20 verse 12. But Jehovah said to Moshe and Aaron, because you did not trust me, 
So as it caused to me caused me to be regarded as holy by the people of Israel, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Amen. So ramifications of his actions was he followed some of the directions, but he didn't follow them all. When you're stressed out, you try to make plans to do things, and sometimes those plans are bad. Okay? You try to, you know, you're losing job, and you know, they've got a lot of craziness going on in the world. You might be looking for a new job, or you know, your job might be getting cut, or something like that. And you make a plan, but the plan is not of God. Okay? Moses didn't listen to God. He got angry. He let his emotions override his heart. Okay? His heart overrode his head. Sorry, his heart overrode his head. I mean, and the Lord says, because you, both of you guys, didn't trust me and make me, you said you bring the water out of the rock. Now, the ramification of their actions, now Aaron's going to die before Moshe, but Moshe's going to go all the way to the, to the edge of the promised land and not be able to go in. Let me say that again. There are ramifications for your actions, of which we're going to go through in message 652 all tomorrow. There's going to be ramifications. There's rewards. There are ramifications for each action. And this is what Beth Goyma teaches, that you know, we're, we're not the fluff and stuff type of ministry. I don't want that. What I'm getting you ready for is your trial in heaven. Because I want to see you there. I'm going to be there. I'm sure of that. I'm following all the commandments as much as I possibly can. Trying to do as much as possible. And, I want to, and my job as a Hebrew is to teach everybody. It is an honor. Why the Lord called me, I don't know. I was talking to my wife the other night. I'm like, I don't know why. Not something I wanted to do. So there's something more that he wants. But my honor is to teach anyone who wants to learn Torah because that's what God wants. Because there's ramification for your actions. There's no two sets of rules for Jews and Gentiles. We are one person. We're not one new man. We've always been one person. There's always been one set of rules for everybody. I hate those people. Well, there were one new man. You don't know what the heck you're talking about. You, oh, God always wanted one, new per, one person only. One set of law for the Jew and the Gentile living among the Jews. And Yeshua said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Because there's ramifications for your actions. Ramifications are bad. Hey, there's evil in our hearts. God flooded the world. There's evil in the hearts. There's homos and fornicators. He destroyed two cities. There was evil in the earth. He had World War I, World War II, a plague that almost wiped out all of Europe. There's ramifications for your actions, ramifications of good. The Lord said, you follow me, I will bless you, I'll make you the head, not the tail. Look at verse 12 again. But Jehovah said to Moshe and Aaron, because you did not trust in me, so as to cause me to be regarded as holy by the people of Israel, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Amen? Now Moses has got to walk with the Lord. Remember we were talking about Cain? He had to walk the rest of his life away from the Lord. Okay, Moses walked with the Lord, and he, he sought the Lord and a couple of times. The Lord said, no, stop talking about this ever again. I'm not going to talk to you about this again. Because I gave you an order. This is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do, and you missed it. There's ramifications for your action, no matter how stressed. Now, I mean, you can go to the Lord and go, oh, you know, come on, his sister died, the whole community came against him. You know, he's not, he's not got the Bible, but he's got the Lord right there with him. You went and prayed, and the Lord's glory came down on you. Now we got the whole book. We got Messiah's own example, and we still get stressed out and get stupid. There's ramifications for your actions. Go to the next slide, turn to Leviticus 5, verse 4. Hold your place there in the midbar. Go to Leviticus 5, verse 4. If someone allows to slip from his mouth an oath to do evil or to do good, and he doesn't remember that he clearly spoke an oath, then no matter what it was about, when he learns of it, he is guilty. Amen? Moses was guilty. He said, I give you water. Uh-uh, Moses. You can strike that rock all you want. The Lord that brought the water. Yeah, you were stressed. 
and I um, empathize with you, you know, dealing with Jews. You know, I deal with Jews that are also Latin. It's quite an interesting thing. But you can't let something pass your lips. Once you do, you can't go, oh, pull the words back. Ah. Engage brain, then speak. You got two eyes, two ears. That means you're supposed to see twice as much and hear twice as, mu twice as much and speak less. But if you let it fly, there's going to be ramifications for your actions. And what did it happen with Moses? He didn't get into the promised land. The Lord said that in the previous slide. Go on to the next slide now. Go back to the midbar. 20 verse 18. 18 to 20. Chapter 20 verse 18 to 20. Now we switch gears in total. But Adam answered, You're not going to pass through my land. If you do, I will come against you, come against you with the sword. The people of Israel replied, We will keep to the highway. If we drink the water, either we or our livestock, we will pay for it. Just let us pass through on foot. It's nothing. But he said, You're not to pass through. And Adam came out against them with many people and much force. Amen? So now they're going to go through some more trials. But the Lord's going to hand them over to them. Okay? But now you're, we're going, we're going on this journey. You don't know where you're going. We'll stay on the road. Uh, and Moses is leading us. And, okay? Now people have start coming against you. Okay? Now, do you get stressed? Don't get stressed. Trust in the Lord. People come against you. Now you've made a mistake, Moses. Now are you going to make another mistake? No. Okay? So Adam came out against them in a big force. And so now let's go on to the next part. The next slide. Verse 24 to 29. 24 to 29. Bamidbar 20. We're just 24 to 29. Let's see what goes on with Aaron. Aaron is about to be gathered to his people because he is not to enter the land I have given to the people of Israel. Inasmuch as you rebelled against when I said at Mirvah Springs, take Aaron and Eleazar his son, bring them to Mount Hor, remove the garments from Aaron and put them on Eleazar's son. Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will die there. Moshe did as, as Jehovah had ordered. They went up, into the, up onto Mount Hor before the eyes of the whole community, Moshe removed the garments from Aaron and put them on Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. When Moshe and Eleazar came down from the mountain, when the entire community saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned Aaron 30 days, the whole house of Israel. Amen? So in the picture you see, like, passing the torch. Okay, so Aaron messed up. This time it was big. You know, remember Aaron messed up before? You know, Moses is on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. And he comes down and, you know, he makes this big lie to Moshe. And he, where did he get this? It just popped out! It just popped out! Okay? But now God is so angry, I'm going to gather. Bring him over here. I'm going to remove him from his office. He's not going to die in office. We're going to remove him. And his son's going to take over. Okay? See, this is what happens when you don't think things through. When you allow your emotions to override your brain. It costs. There are ramifications for your actions, both the positive and negative. And we're seeing the negative. So Eleazar is now being lifted up by the Lord, being, and he's being lifted up in front of everybody, so they're going to realize who the, the Kohen Haggadol is. Okay? But you, you're losing it because why? Because look back at verse 24. Aaron is about to be gathered to his people because he is not to enter the land I have given to the people of Israel inasmuch as you rebelled against what I had said in the Mirabah Springs. Amen? Now, what's also interesting about that? He was going to enter. Remember the spies that we read about a couple weeks ago? Okay? Yehoshua and, Eli and, and uh, Caleb, they were going to enter. But Moshe and Aaron were going to enter also. They trusted the Lord. But now, because he didn't trust in the Lord, because he didn't stop, Mo like after Moses, what are you doing? He would have said, stop! And Moses hit. Then you would have tried to stop him. You would have been released of that vow. 
But no. But no. Ramifications for your actions. Very important. When you're going against God, and don't think that God doesn't hear your thoughts. Don't think that God doesn't know what you're doing. He's, a, he's amazing. He knows everything. Everything. So people are trying to plan this, I'm going to plan this, I'm going to plan that, I'm going to do this, going to do that. Oh, you really are. Right. Right. You're going to do it without God? I don't think so. Going on to the next slide. Chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. Chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. The people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? Oh, shut up. There's no real food. There's no water. We're sick of this miserable stuff we're eating. In response, Jehovah sent poisonous snakes among the people. They bit the people and many of Israel people, many of Israel's people died. Amen. So now the people are gonna get it. They're complaining again. Why don't you just go to Mo hey, Moses? Can you ask God like how long it's gonna take? You know, you know, uh, I like this stuff is okay, but I'd really like a pizza. You know, that cow smelled really good. You know, this manna stuff is really good and you know, but hey, uh, you know, how about some corn on the cob or, you know, a pizza? Okay, but here they start complaining again. And they're saying, why did you bring us out of Egypt? They have forgotten where they came from. A lot of people come in here to Beth Goyim. They're, they're on fire. They want to know the Lord. Their answers are getting, their questions are being answered. I answer all their questions. And then a couple years down, the road, where did so-and-so go? And you see it. In ministry, we see it. You know, people, do, people haven't changed in 3,000 years. They're still the same. And I'm watching people like, yeah, it's going to go the way of the snake. She's going to go the way of the snake. Oh, that one, yeah. Oh, that one's going to make it. That one's going to persevere through. You get complacent instead of saying, I want to do more for the Lord. Can I teach a class? Sure. I'm going to sit and listen. My son Connor tried to do that once. Okay? But people start to start to nitpick and they start to not focus on the Lord. So the Lord gets angry and says, All right, I'll send you a bunch of snakes. How do you fight a snake? Run. <laughs> you know, you know, not that snake. You know, and you know, you're like, oh no, no, no. He done didn't send one snake. You know, remember the Indiana Jones? You know, remember? He, he Send me a torch. Drop a torch down and the whole floor is all snakes. I hate snakes. Okay, remember that scene in the Indiana Jones? The first one? Oh, you got to see it. It's pretty good. Okay? So the Lord didn't just send, like we see one, a picture here of one snake. I don't think the Lord just, it says, Jehovah sent poisonous snakes, plural. Okay? Okay, hold your spot there. Go to Matthew 12. We're talking about snakes. Matthew 12, verse 33 and 34. Matthew 12, verse 33 and 34. Matthew 12, verse 33 and 34. Could be snakes in Florida. Matthew 12, verse 33 and 34. If you make the tree good, the fruit will be good. And if you make a tree bad, its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. You snakes! How can you who are evil say anything good? For out from the mouth speaks what overflows from the heart. Amen? You know, a lot of people go, well, Yeshua was nice and loving. Uh, no. When he's calling them a snake, he's calling them a devil worshiper. He's calling them people that are complainers. He's, you know, you just don't understand because most people say, well, you know, you, she would never said any bad, well, anything bad. Yeah, you just un don't understand the language. He's referring to snakes. Okay, we're paralleling it with Bamidbar 21. The snakes were there to bite people because you're biting me because you're being a pain. You're being a whiner, a complainer. You're not following the laws of God. Okay, so Yeshua says snakes. Going on to the next part. The next slide. 
going to go for another five more minutes. Mimibar 21, verse 7. 7 through 9. 7 through 9. Mimibar 21. This is a very important part to understand. The people came to Moshe and said, We sinned by speaking against Jehovah and against you. Pray to Jehovah that he rid us of these snakes. Moshe prayed for the people. And Jehovah answered Moshe, Make a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. When anyone who has been bitten sees it, he will live. Moshe made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. The snake had bitten someone then. When he looked toward this bronze snake, he stayed alive. Amen? This is a great passage, verse 7 through 9, when you're witnessing to Jewish people about, so you just got to look at something and you're going to be healed from a snake bite. Okay? Because they can't believe in Yeshua because we're going to parallel this with Yeshua in John 3 in a moment. So, you want me to make a snake, put it on a cross, because at least it's going to have something, because it's not just going to be a pole, it's going to have a cross, okay? It's going to have something to hang on because snakes don't have fingers, okay? They don't can't <laughs> grab on the thing, so it's got to crawl up, you know, and then it's going to, like on a branch, it hangs on a branch, okay? You ever see a snake in a tree? Okay, watch Jungle Book and you'll see Mowgli and the snake, okay? So, but snakes do that and they'll drop on you. Okay? Because they'll release from holding on to something that's holding them. So it's on a, basically a cross. Okay? So they got, they're sinning, and all you got to do is, now you've been bit by the snake, now all you got to do is look at the snake on the cross, and that'll heal you? Sounds a little bit New Testament, if you ask me. Well, let's go to, speaking of the New Testament, let's go to it. Hold your place there and turn to John 3. John 3, verse 14 through 17. John 3, verse 14 through 17. A couple more slides and we're done for the prosh. We'll get through the whole prosh. John 3, Yochanan 3, verse 14 through 17. Just as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the sun be lifted up so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life, instead of being utterly destroyed. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but rather so that through him the world might be saved. Amen? So and this ties together with Isaiah 53. He became sin for us. Okay? So just as Moshe lifted up the, the snake, so Yeshua, to Yeshua will be lifted up. You look to the one who's on the cross, you will be healed from the sickness that's in your life. If you look to him, the, fa the author and the finisher of our life, the, the potter, become the clay. Look to him so that he can form you into something good. Stop being stressed out. Listen to the words of God. Listen to Messiah. Follow his example. Yeshua became sin for us. And sin is rep represented by the snake on the cross. Yehovah in, in Yeshayahu in Isaiah 53 said he, be, he became sin. It pleased the Lord to crush him. Our sickness he put on him. How could, looking at a snake, you've bit, just been bitten by a cobra. You're going to die. How can looking at a snake on a cross uh, heal you? Yeshua became that. Looking to him heals you of your sickness. Go back to Numbers 21. Two more slides. Numbers 21, verse 22, 21. Bumidbar 21, verse 21 to 24. Israel sent messengers to Shechom, king of Amorai, with this message. Let me pass through your land. We won't turn aside to the field of the vineyard. We won't drink any water from the wells. We'll, 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 we will go along the king's highway until we have left your territory. But Shechon would not allow Israel to pass through this territory. Instead, Shechon mustered all the people went out into the desert to fight Israel. On reaching Yechaz, he fought Israel. Israel defeated him by force of arms and took control of his land from Arnon to the Yarbuk River, but only as far as the people of Ammon because the territory of the people of Ammon was well defended. Amen? So now they're walking. They've been healed. The Lord, the Lord blesses. He's a God of mercy. Okay? 
Okay. Now, a bunch of people died when they didn't look at the snake before the snake was put up. A lot of people died, but now they're walking. And now if somebody comes against you, but the Lord still remembers his promises. Okay, so here Sakon comes out, the MRI, and hey, we're just going to walk along the king's highway. We're not going to do nothing. But nope. Well, they come out, and the Lord defends him and defends Israel, and then they win. Going on to the final slide for tonight's parash. Let's turn to verse 33 to 35 now. They turn and went up along the road to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, marched out against them with all his people to fight at uh, Edri. Jehovah said to Moshe, don't be afraid of him. I have handed him over to you with all his people and his land. You will treat him just as you did Shekong, the king of the Amorite, who lived at Heshbon. So they struck him down with his sons and all the people until there was no one left alive, and they took control of his land. Amen? So here the Lord is now blessing his people. He's giving it over because these people don't want to work with Israel. Sorry, I got something in my eye here. Okay? So when you walk with the Lord, you'll have victory. When you follow the Lord's commandments, you'll have victory. The snake was there so that we can look to that snake. Yeshua became sin, like a snake, so that we can look to him, put our sins on him, and be healed. When we get stressed... We don't think things through. Moshe was very stressed and made a very big mistake. A mistake he couldn't take back. What we really draw from this particular parash is before you do an action, think about your action. How is it going to affect your eternity? Tune in tomorrow, or if you're listening to this on recording, a message 652, ramifications for your actions. Well, this has been a lovely time. We've had a great time. We've earned a lot. I bid you an amen and an amen and a stressed out. Don't be stressed out. Amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to the Remnants Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. 
that Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our king's word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the new week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, Many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and biblical holy day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.